Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Shelley Casto. I'm Director of Education here at the Wexner Center for the Arts and I'm very pleased to have you here with us this evening to celebrate this exhibition, Martin Wong, Human Instamatic, and it is an incredible exhibition. So I know after um, this talk, you'll go in and enjoy. It is really wonderful. So um, some thank yous. First off, I want to thank the Bronx Museum of Art for organizing the exhibition we have on view here this evening. The exhibition was co-curated by tonight's speakers, Antonio Sergio Besa and Yasmin Ramirez, who I will introduce uh, more fully in a moment. Um, and support for the exhibition was provided by the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts and the Henry Luce Foundation. Um, to present the exhibition here in-house, uh, we are entirely beholden to an incredible team that we have on our staff, most notably Lucy Zimmerman on our exhibitions team for keeping track of every detail from day one Zach Kelly, uh, Dave Dickus, and their team for a very sensitive installation design. It really looks beautiful in our galleries here. Brandon Balog, Erica Anderson, and Ryan Schaefer for their graphic and editorial labors. Tracy McCambridge for getting our docents ready to tour. We had a wonderful session with uh, our curators here um, this morning. It was really terrific. I know you'll enjoy hearing from them too. Um, Mark Van Fleet and Allison Binger for their res registrarial attentions. Um, and Amber Dupre for facilitating the presence of the opening's guests among us for this occasion this evening. Um, the exhibition also very much required the attentions of our exhibitions manager, Meg Megan Cavanaugh, and our curator at large, Bill Har Harrigan. So it's, it, it, again, it is a wonderful installation. Um, our team also very much wants to thank Annalise Biednell, director PPOW. Uh, she and her colleagues have been very generous with resources and information in helping us to um, translate this exhibition here at the Wexner Center. Um, now for our speakers, um, Sergio Bessa is director of curatorial and education programs at the Bronx Museum of Art and has curated a wide range of exhibitions on artists Joan Semmel and Paolo Bruschi among many group exhibitions. He's about to open the exhibition Wild Noise, artwork from the Bronx Museum of Art and El Museo Nacional de Bellas Artes a la Habana, which will realize the most ambitious visual arts collaboration between the US and Cuba in over 50 years. I thought that was really exciting. So congratulations, um, Sergio. That exhibition opens at the Bronx Museum May 21st. Bessa received his MFA from Pratt and PhD from NYU in art education and lectures at Columbia University Teachers College. Yasmin Ramirez serves as an adjunct curator at the Bronx Museum and has also collaborated on curatorial projects with El Museo del Barrio, the Loisada Center, the Caribbean Culture Center, the Studio Museum in Harlem, Franklin Furness, the Center for Puerto Rican Studies at Hunter College, NYU Department of Social and Cultural Analysis, and Tayer Boricua. <laughs> Thank you. A personal friend of Martin Wong, she has many an fun anecdotes to share. Um, she's published several essays on his work, including Martin Wong, Chino Malo, in Fresh Talk, Daring Gazes, Conversations on Asian American Art, and La Vida, The Life and Writings of Miguel Pinera in The Art of Martin Wong, in Sweet Oblivion, uh, published by the New Museum of Contemporary Art. Yasmin holds a PhD in art history from the Graduate Center of the City of New York. So please welcome Sergio Bessa and Yasmin Ramirez. So what about if I just use this? That's fine. Pass it back to okay. Yes. Very well. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you, Shelley. Sure. And, uh, thanks to everyone. Um, everyone has been very kind uh, this morning to myself and to Yasmin. Uh, and of course, it's a great privilege to bring the exhibition here to the Waxman. Uh, it was quite a lot of work for the Bronx Museum. We are a much, much smaller team there, so this was a kind of a heroic effort uh, to put this exhibition together. And uh, what I, um, what we have today, um, it, it's not really like um, an art historical talk. We just mean uh, this presentation today to be uh, sort of an introduction to the exhibition that you will see in the galleries. 
And uh, we will sort of set aside a little bit all the theoretical frame and all these kind of complicated ideas because I think one of the joys of this project with the uh, working with the, the, the state of Martin Long was to actually uh, sort of uh, find a real person behind the work, a person that did not need a lot of uh, conceptualization on top of uh, what he, his practice, uh, on top of what he was doing. So it's very, uh, it's, the exhibition is, is visually really compelling and there is a lot of ideas and there is a lot of concepts, of course, but it's also, um, it just kind of tells a story of, uh, uh, of an individual. And uh, what we're gonna try to do today with this slide uh, uh, demonstration is just to kind of highlight some of these, uh, these moments in, uh, in, in, in Martin's life. So uh, Martin was born in Portland, Oregon in 1946. Um, and uh, he grew up in uh, San Francisco. So you have to understand that uh, that era, so he, he, he's still a, a very young man when uh, the sort of the beat generation is at the height. And when he's a teenager, he witnessed the explosion of the counterculture in California. And these two movements uh, deeply informed the person that he became. Uh, when he's very young, he writes profusively, uh, poetry mostly, and uh, it's a poetry that is very influenced by uh, the poetry that, that he was reading at the time, uh, by uh, folks like Allen Ginsberg, but also influenced by hippie ideas, so the, the poems, they have a little bit of uh, psychedelia and uh, uh, observation of phenomena and nature and, and things like that. And, uh, uh, and I think he always cultivated kind of an, uh, an artistic interest. But both his parents were engineers and, uh, and I think he, he might have felt this push to, to excel in some areas like that. So his first choice in college was to go to architecture school and he dropped uh, at the end of the first year and he uh, went to Humboldt College uh, in Eureka, uh, Northern California. And there he focused on ceramics. So during this time, uh, it's uh, a time he's living away from his, his parents, he, uh, he befriends a lot of hippies in that area of Eureka and other communities around uh, Eureka. And uh, he makes a living uh, by doing portraits of people on the streets. And that's how he comes up with this moniker, The Human in Somatic. And that was the title that we choose to our exhibition because I think it's very befitting um, to the selection that we did. So this is actually the card that he would pass on the streets to advertise his business. And um, I think he charged like a dollar for a portrait. Uh, you know what I mean? Something like that? Yeah. Uh, so here is a, a very kind of uh, interesting sort of documentation. I actually had an opportunity to, to visit uh, Martin's mother about five or six years ago in San Francisco. And uh, I went there to meet her and to get the permission to do the exhibition and also to interview her. I was very curious to know more about Martin's life in San Francisco. And uh, the moment that we op she opened the door and I got in, the house was impregnated with the, uh, the spirit of Martin Long. He had, throughout his whole life, he had collected a number of objects and those collections they were basically um, built in collaboration with his mother. So even when he lived in California, sometimes he would call her and say, oh, I found this uh, Chinese screen, or I found a drawing by Mondrian, or I found this box by Andy Warhol. And she would wire the money and he would buy an auction. And uh, so they had this kind of uh, very active partnership 
in collecting things. So the house was packed with chotkas and the, and actually some of this material was um, about two or three years ago was shown at uh, the Guggenheim as part of a work by Dan Vo, the Danish artist, who bought this entire collection and made a piece, uh, uh, a piece of his own work out of this. And now this collection is at the Walker Art Center. But for me, the, the biggest revelation was when she took me to his bedroom. So this is Martin's bedroom. And it's a period that we cannot see his bed because she kept the bedroom totally intact, uh, the bedroom that he, he had when he was a teen, and that he would always come back later when he moved out of house. And uh, this series of portraits that you're going to see here in the galleries, for me it was very striking because you can see here that the earliest of these portraits was probably <laughs> painted when he was about 12 or 13 years old. And in a sense, it tracks his entire um, adolescence. So he continued painting uh, these very straightforward portraits until he was 16 or 17 by the time that he went to college. And for me, when I saw this, I've, I had the confirmation of the concept of the exhibition, which was to kind of uh, show the, the arc of progress of this artist that goes from something very introspective, uh, he growing up very alone as an only child, and then later uh, going in the world and, and engaging with communities that was probably you know, not his community, but he embraced those communities as if those communities were part of his families. So that happened in the Bay Area. He became very closely associated with a group called the Coquettes, uh, which was a performance group uh, that was created in 1969 by a bunch of hippies. And it became very popular. And then they had a, a second iteration called the Angels of Light. And um, we have some documentation about um, those performances there. And then most telling, when he comes to New York in 1978, and after a few years of living in complete isolation, he goes to the Lois side, and he creates a new community with some of these young artists that he meets there. So here we have um, one example of the ceramics that he, um, he created during his years in, at Humboldt. And this work is um, in, in the galleries. And also we wanted to include some of the works. There is a couple of works that he did when he was transitioning from ceramics to uh, painting. And this one, as you can read uh, at the bottom, it started in Eureka in, uh, uh, I believe, 1978. And it ends in uh, New York. So we, it took him some time to execute this painting. Um, this work, um, he's still using the skulls. Right. right. That's, that's why we included Exactly. That. So around this time, he had traveled. It's a Himalayan. Uh, it's a Himalayan motif. Right. Around this time, he, like many hippies from uh, his, uh, among his friends, he traveled in, in Asia. And he actually collected a lot of uh, uh, photography and uh, documentation of Himalayan art. And this painting is indebted to that. The skulls, for example, they make reference both to Mesoamerican uh, art, but also to uh, Himalayan art, and particularly the flames and the smokes around the eight ball. The yeah. other thing um, is that in addition to, to doing these portraits, um, he also had like a little store he, he, was, he, he sold some of his objects. So Martin um, always had, a, he always had like side jobs um, throughout his career, as successful as he was. He really enjoyed this idea of bartering and selling and collecting. He collected the work of other artists that he knew. He cr created a very large collection of graffiti art that was exhibited in New York City about 
two years ago, a very successful exhibit of, of his collection. So um, this, this work also is an, an indication of a, several kinds of works from popular culture to the tchotchkes, because I mean, the eight ball is kind of like a little tchotchke, um, also a reference um, to, to his father, but um, he depicted what he saw, but he also, in, he also collected and enjoyed reselling that work, mm -hmm. which I thought was always very interesting right. about Martin. Yeah. Let me show another image here. So this is a painting that, it's very important in the exhibition. Um, it marks the transition when he comes to New York in 1978. And uh, Martin goes to New York with basically knowing no one in the city. And he comes with no concrete plans. And uh, it, it's very typical of that time uh, of a uh, uh, number of uh, young struggling artists doing the kind of thing, going, off New York, going to New York and just kind of trying to uh, find a, a way to, to live in the city. So he goes to this hotel called Mayor's Hotel, and, uh, and in exchange for a job as a night porter, he gets uh, uh, this room. And you can see on the walls in the painting, inside the painting, that's where he begins to kind of uh, develop his uh, practice, and he actually refines his style during this time. So it's very telling that the the room is seen through these two windows. So the windows, in a sense, they frame the picture in these bricks. And these bricks and frames with bricks will become this very distinctive trait in Martin's work from then on. Um, this is a time also when he develops a series of paintings about sign language. And I will ask Yasmin to talk a little bit about this because she has some good ideas about this. But it's a very kind of interesting um, kind of a series of works. When you go in the gallery, you'll notice that this particular work, it says, it is in this room that the world's first paintings for the hearing impaired came into being. Um, and there's a couple of things that Martin, what was, was occurring in Martin's life at the time. What, what I found quite strange is Martin f always enjoyed being around people and he was part of collectives when he was in Eureka and in San Francisco and California. Then he comes to this big bustling city and what does he do? He completely isolates. It's, it's a, it was an odd choice to come to this big city with the intention of being an artist, but then he decides to live in isolation. Um, and he said that he actually spoke very, he, he, he hardly spoke to anyone for the first two years he was in New York, which is hard to believe, but um, that's one of the stories that he told me. And so the death mute, um, the card, becomes a way of, he becomes interested in that because he felt very much like a mute in the city because he wasn't speaking to anyone. The second thing that I, uh, that I, that I found in, in this work and that Martin will say time and again is that he was interested in sort of finding um, a way of creating, a new way of creating traditional Chinese painting. So if you look at Chinese characters, um, and in some of the works, you can see, like right here, it's, these are Chinese characters and they're like little blocks. And I think part of his attraction to the sign language was that it had that block, glyphic-like um, writing style that you see in Aztec painting and Mayan painting that he liked, seals, and also Chinese painting. So that's another aspect of his practice is he once said to me, I'm still a traditional Chinese painter. I uh, paint uh, poems in the sky, um, but I'm using sign language rather than the, ca the, the traditional Chinese characters. Mm -hmm. So this, this painting is a very uh, interesting uh, example of his work. Uh, I really call your attention when you go to the galleries and uh, it's a very small painting, but it's very powerful. And in this painting it shows actually uh, how smart 
Martin was. There is actually um, a number of people that think that Martin was um, an outsider artist. He's actually the opposite of an outsider artist. He's an extremely smart artist, very knowledgeable of American culture. So this painting, for example, you can actually make comparison with Hopper, for example. There is a painting of Hopper of the Lower East Side showing the Williamsburg Bridge that the angle is pretty much like this. But then also he complicates things with the sign language and the constellations. And the, this painting also, um, in the exhibition he has a, sort of a, an interesting role because we have a series of documentary material about Martin and in, among those documents, there is a letter he wrote to his parents. And he does a little sketch of this painting and he says, oh, I think this is the last time I'm gonna do sign language. So look for that letter and look for this painting in the exhibition. It's really a remarkable work. Um, again, I wanna ask Yasmin to talk about this painting and the series of paintings that follow because this is a painting that it's not in the exhibition but I felt very strongly about showing here because it's probably his most important work. It's in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum. And uh, uh, remarkably enough, he sold this, ex this painting to the museum even before he had his first gallery exhibition. So he has a lot of uh, uh, story behind this. Yasmin, can okay. you comment on well, this? Well, this is the painting that kind of um, brought us together for the first time in any substantive way. Um, just a little background. So Martin told, uh, tells me that um, he's living in the Myers Hotel. And one, one night, the guy says, listen, um, this building is being sold, or you've got you've to get out um, within the next month. And he says that that very day, that very night, he, he decides to go out and get an, a new place to live. And he's walking up and down the streets of uh, the Lower East Side, and he's a asking people, um, hey, does, are there any uh, apartments here? And um, he meets, a, he sees a group of kids or whatever, and they say, well, you know, this building, not that many people are living there. We think you could probably squat up there. Because that was going on on the Lower East Side at that time. I mean, the Lower East Side and the South Bronx really look like Berlin. After the wall, people would squat apartments, people would squat, um, places were abandoned. And so he goes up there and he meets the, um, the landlord and that's how he gets to the Lower East Side on Attorney Street, just by asking people and kind of just moving in. So he still doesn't know anyone really um, in, in the East Village, uh, the Lower East Side and the Lower East Side. And um, at the same time, there's a lot of other artists that are moving into the neighborhood. Um, they, and there's a local gallery called um, ABC No Rio. It's pretty famous now. There's now two books about all of the artists that came out of this community gallery. And he showed one of his works there at this um, exhibit called The Crime Show. And it's at that sh exhibition that he meets the famous poet Miguel Pinero who is the author of um, Short Eyes and the co-founder of the New Yorican Poets Cafe in New York City, and they form a fast friendship. Miguel Pinero was um, in, he wrote his first play while he was in jail um, and was in and out of jail um, throughout his life, even as a writer, even though he was a successful writer, he was very um, attracted to um, the dark side of New York, and he, he kind of, he would, he would stick up people less because he needed to, but more for the thrill. Um, so he meets Miguel Pinero, and um, Miguel Pinero asks him to paint. So this is a really a collaboration, his first collaboration with, with a poet who would pretty much become a, a very important part of his life and his way of looking at the Lower East Side. And that was, it's called Attorney Street Handball Court. And um, he asked Martin, could you paint this handball court because one of my protégés has a tag on it. The tag is like, you know, their, their, their symbol. And so Martin, in, in this work, you see him reproduce graffiti, which at that time was explosive in New York City. Um, it's also the way that he begins to collect graffiti art. You have the sign language painting, and then all throughout, you know, you also have 
the first time, up, up here you have the first poem, a poem that um, Miguel Pinero wrote and that is included in this work. And there are several um, very important works by Miguel Pinero that you're going, uh, poems by Miguel Pinero about the Lower East Side that are included in the exhibition. It takes a, it takes a while to read them because often, like for example, this is uh, Miguel Pinero reading one of his more famous poems of Scatter My Ashes on the Lower East Side. And that poem is um, written throughout the border of this work. Um, so it's another, it's another one in which you see, he's also writing in Spanish uh, because this, the Lower East Side was predominantly Puerto Rican. Um, so Martin Wong begins to pick up Spanish, like pidgin Spanish, um, and looks at books and begins to incorporate um, bits of Spanish language from comic books that he would read. So if you really know Spanish, you'll know that, in fact, some of what he's writing is, 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 doesn't fully make sense. But that is also part of the charm of this work. Uh, can you also talk a little bit about these two images? Because this is also the Roy side, and Sharp okay. is another very good friend of Martin. So um, Martin, it's, it's through his relationship with Miguel Pinero that uh, Martin begins to meet people in the neighborhood, feel more comfortable. He's also, he meets Sharp when, when he's, while he's working at um, a place called Pearl Paint which is a lot like, I guess, today, Blick Arts. It's, it was a big um, art store, one of the, well, the largest art store in New York was on Canal Street. And he meets um, Days. Uh, graffiti writers at that time, um, mm, part of the practice is to kind of steal the, um, uh, the spray paint. It was called inventing. I'm gonna go out and invent some spray paint for myself. So the way that he met um, Days was that Days was trying to actually steal some spray paint. Mm -hmm. And then they struck up a conversation. And Days becomes one of, one of Martin's most favored, favorite models. And he paints Days throughout his life. Um, so, I mean, right, Days and Sharp. Uh, so he, he paints Sharp throughout his life. So you're going to, when you go through the galleries, the gorgeous, what you might think is a gorgeous young Latino Puerto Rican guy is, is, is Days, but the fact was, it's, I mean, was Sharp, but in fact, Sharp wasn't Puerto Rican at all. Another, uh, <laughs> he was black and Jewish. So that's the way in which um, Martin, Martin never really fully cared about truth in that way. You know, I mean, he wasn't a person who, who, cared that much about bloodlines and being authentic in that way. He was a painter who was authentic to his vision. And Sharp was part of this vision of the perfect Latino, young Latino man that he fantasized about. Um, so he, uh, he painted what he saw and he liked Sharp to be this Latino character, even though he wasn't. Uh, I very recently did a, a studio visit with the uh, Lee Quinones, yeah. who was also from this group of graffiti artists. And Lee said that uh, he used to go to Pearl Paint because Martin would put a lot of stuff in a bag and he would miswrite the value of it. So, uh, you know, they would get like a lot of material for very little and the person kind of uh, in the cashier just didn't pay attention to what was in the bag and, you know, so Martin was helping all these guys yeah, yeah. by doing that kind of thing. Um, so we have a series of uh, paintings that kind of depict uh, the Lois side at the time. You pay attention to some of these buildings that it's all boarded up by bricks. And this is very realistic. And you are going to see in one of the vitrines we have photographs that Martin did uh, because his paintings, they're all based on uh, very minute um, uh, observation of, uh, of the environment. Even this, a painting like this, which is a wonderful, very poetic, uh, it's a scene of destruction, it's just rubble, and the title is Everything Must Go, that you can read 
sort of in many ways, because everything must go is a, is a sales pitch when a, a store is selling everything. But it's also this idea of, uh, of renewal that, you know, things come to an end, but we'll come back. And you see these beautiful constellations in, in the back. So it's a very kind of, uh, when, you, when, you, when you look at Martin's work in hindsight, there is a, a sense of romanticism uh, uh, about that era. That it's not, um, um, it's not mystifying, but it's really looking at that very hard time with a lot of dignity and, uh, and, and hope, I'd say. Well, Would you agree? Yes. What I could say about, I grew up in New York. I was born in Brooklyn. And so, like, um, our, our playgrounds were rubble. And to a kid, I mean, you don't, you don't know that this is rubble. Um, and even to a teenager, I mean, all this rubble that we saw was, we saw it with a sense of wonderment. And also, um, when you see it, it looks like sculpture. There's amazing things that you can find. You can always imagine that you're, gonna, that, that you're on a treasure hunt, and there's all these sculptural objects everywhere. So it was a it was an very artistic kind of found object land that, you know, New York is now quite pristine and everything, it's all in its place. But at that time, you never knew who you could see on the street. You never knew what you could find in a pile of rubble. And everything, especially when you're in your teenage years or in your early 20s, everything seems possible and everything seems to be able to be, you know, you, can, you have this sense that out of junk, you're going to make a masterpiece and it happens. And it happens with Martin all the time. So I think we're running out of time a little bit, but uh, I just want to speed up a little bit. But as part of this romantic view of uh, that era, uh, the, his fixation on, on firemen is, is a, a very strong element. And here, you know, this image has become like a huge kind of uh, homoerotic kind of uh, icon. But uh, there are many layers to this. Uh, um, one of the writers for the catalog, she made this point that uh, the, besides the homoerotic value of this, there is also the, the fact that firemen, are the, they are the guys that actually they go into the fire. They go, uh, they don't turn their backs to, uh, to the disaster. They actually go in there. And also they go in pairs. So, you know, when she told me, uh, Julie Alt, who wrote a beautiful essay for the catalog, she made this point, and I think it's very interesting to think about uh, this kind of thing in Martin's work. But this fascination with firemen is something that started very early on, and in, in the documentation that we have accompanying the show, you will see two photographs of Martin at age four and five on top of a fire truck, and you are gonna see the joy of this young boy kind of a fantasizing about, I believe at the time it was still not at this level, but uh, it was something that started very early on. And uh, it, um, the, also part of the romanticization, the, the, the constellations are the same thing, but, oh, what happened here? Okay. But the firemen, they keep coming, and uh, they are almost like this kind of, uh, signifier of, uh, of reassurance, of, uh, you know, of security. So, um, yeah, go ahead. A couple of things is, um, first of all, Martin had a fireman's, um, a real fireman's costume. He would, he would love to go to openings dressed as a fireman. Right. With Which is his cowboy, the law. With his cowboy hat. So that was a kind of, he, he really enjoyed dress up. And he enjoyed dressing up his friends um, as firemen. So none of these are actual firemen. They're guys that are hanging out with Martin, mm -hmm. whom he puts the fire costumes on mm -hmm. and paints them. This is Stevie, Stevie who yeah. we believe might have been one of his lovers. We mm -hmm. don't know for sure. But Stevie was never a fireman. But he, would, he has several photographs of Stevie dressed as a fireman. 
And uh, here again, we have the firemen saving the city from uh, a huge flood. Um, uh, and this painting, I just want to talk about this one because this painting for me was a very important uh, image for the exhibition because it, it kind of relates to a series of paintings that we're going to see later, which is his vision of New York City as, um, as a prison. So the walls that we see that sort of begins to creep in, there is really this kind of uh, sense of, uh, uh, of being in prison, even in the, the paintings that he did of his bedroom and so forth. But in here, you see very well that you know, this, the, the walls, they're kind of encircling everyone. But actually, it's a prison that it's not depressing. People are actually enjoying themselves. And uh, we are going to see in the prisons, uh, the, the paintings that he did, the prisons, that it's kind of a continuation of this. And here, the law is symbolized not by policemen, but by firemen, kind of overseeing the whole uh, scene. Well, so, there were a lot of firemen, because there were a lot of fires on the Lower East Side, because people too. were burning, yeah. you know, like, um, at, at that time, um, people who owned buildings could realize more from burning their buildings and collecting on insurance than from the rent. Yeah. So that was just part of what people did. Um, and also, the buildings were really unsafe. So sometimes the fires happen just because of electrical fires. So there is an element of, of, of just practicality. Um, I, I do want to say one thing is that during the opening, which was during the press opening, in fact, completely unexpected, a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of firemen come in because they always have to do an inspection before the exhibition opens. And so we have the press there, and then there's all of these firemen. And I was really kind of all nervous that maybe they might take offense at you know, their, this very erotic depiction of their profession. And um, they were fascinated, weren't they? They were charmed by the whole thing. Yeah. They're making yeah. jokes among themselves and so forth. Uh, this is a very small painting, but I think it's a very powerful little piece. And I think this also marks the moment when his writing is changing. And it's very influenced by Pinheiro. Pinheiro was very straightforward. And here you have Martin just kind of uh, really talking about the, his desire, uh, how he, uh, the, the kind of man that he likes. Very, it's not fantasized at all. It's like very straightforward, um, amazing little painting. This painting is also not in the show, but I wanted to, um, to show here because this um, belongs to Dan Vo. It was hard for us to bring to, to New York because it was in Mexico at the time. But this is the, the screen that firemen uh, hold when people are jumping to, from the buildings. And uh, this is a painting that was uh, painted in 1998. And uh, Ju Julie Ault has written beautifully about this because uh, Martin died in 1999. So uh, he knew he was, you know, the, the end was near. Uh, he died of AIDS. Um, and, uh, and after, you know, five long years of uh, fighting the disease, and uh, his, one of his last images is actually an image associated with the fireman, which is a, a very powerful statement. We have a series of paintings also that it's just brickwork, which is really uh, beautifully done, but also like very, um, uh, very mysterious. And again, kind of uh, talks a little bit about this contradiction between sort of uh, this, this hope, but also kind of hitting a wall, uh, literally. So this one, for example, the title is Heaven. So his depiction of heaven is actually a brick wall with a tiny little passage in the center. Um, or this one, which is also a fantastic piece, uh, Rapture. Uh, and Rapture for him is, again, it's a brick wall. So there is like a very kind of strong symbolism in his paintings that, you know, it makes no sense for us to kind of uh, interpret that, but I think it's very interesting for viewers to actually ponder about that. 
Yasmin, you want to talk about this? This is a painting that actually belongs to the Bronx Museum collection, and it was a gift by Yasmin, because uh, Martin painted this specifically for an exhibition that Yasmin curated. Go ahead. Yes. Um, well, it's called um, The Taino Invasion from Outer Space, 1993. It was part of a group exhibition I, I invited Martin to participate in, where um, basically um, it was called, the exhibition was called Reconquista, and um, the Taino, this is, Tainos were the pre-Columbian people of the Caribbean, specifically um, in Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic, and, 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 and Cuba. And um, he, most, interestingly enough, Martin was one of the few artists in the 1980s that was really painting the Puerto Rican community, because Puerto Rican artists in the 1970s and 80s um, like Chicano artists, um, were really interested in, for example, doing work about, with pre-Columbian motifs. So Martin was one of the few people that really painted our faces, our reality. Our own artists were interested more in resurrecting uh, the pre-Columbian kind of fantasy world that, um, that they wanted to reintroduce to us as our sort of um, authentic imagery of ourselves. So um, Martin painted this based on some um, cases in the Metropolitan Museum and also in the Museum of Natural History where he's kind of imagining that the, um, the sculptures are being reanimated, are coming back into life by UFOs and um, that are beaming down and kind of reanimating the spirit. And that was part of the idea of the show is um, the return of the Tainos. And in the middle, what you see is um, a lot of, a lot of um, businesses in New York City that are named after, that named themselves Taino because it became a very popular thing in the 70s and 80s among, among Puerto Ricans to acknowledge these pre-Columbian roots. So it was a way of like um, bridging pre-Columbian mm -hmm. work with contemporary practice. And um, I loved this work and I gave it to the Bronx Museum because again, uh, with identity politics, um, Martin Wong was not Latino. I always have, I, I, I said that he was a, a, a sort of a, a Chino Latino because there are Chinese populations in Latin America. And I said, well, you're like a first generation Chino Latino because you came to the Lower East Side and you integrated within the neighborhood and it's sort of like you became part of our community and therefore I do see you as part of the legacy of Latin American and Latino art in New York. And he was always really happy with, with you know, my acceptance of him as a Latino artist. And, um, but at that time, in the 80s and 90s, they were, we were still in New York, we had, a, even, a, even in our institutions, we had this very strict idea of identity. And so because Martin wasn't like a blood, wasn't a blood, a blood, his father wasn't Latino, his mother wasn't necessarily Latino, the, the El Museo del Barrio said that they couldn't have this work because he wasn't authentically Latino according to that kind of idea of what Latinidad was. But the Bronx Museum, yeah. being so much more ahead of the time, just accepted the work. And this is what's so interesting about Martin is that he really broke with all these kind of categories. Right? Absolutely. He really refused to be painted in a niche like the Asian American or this or that. Absolutely. Uh, he actually cut a very kind of a odd figure. A, a lot of people in New York remember him dressed in a three-piece suit with a cowboy hat. And uh, uh, he, he was just a very odd kind of a mix of a lot of uh, different influences. Yeah, he was like an urban cowboy. He could be an urban cowboy one day right. or an urban cowboy fireman. He was completely at home. Right. It, none of it was a pose. Yeah. It was really who he was. He just dared to paint what he wanted yeah. and dared to be who he wanted to be. He was a voracious, he was a workaholic. Yeah. A, I mean, if you went to his house, he's basically talking to you, but he's painting all the time. All the time. Mm -hmm. 
So a few more images about um, he, he really became kind of a chronicler of uh, the low East side and the Latino community. I love this painting. I'm very happy we included it here. And as Yasmin said, this is a, it's really interesting that you don't see paintings like this painted by Puerto Ricans, right? No. Yasmin. No, you, you, it, not it at took that time. Martin to actually come and do this kind of and thing. And this actually, you know, it, it's funny because it, it, it kind of foregrounds what is becoming much more of a, a fad now is you know, Afro-Latinidad because you could see that this man is, looks very African mm -hmm. and that is sort of the new wave sure. in, in, in Latino art is yeah. the reclamation not just of the pre-Columbian people but also of our African um, roots as well. So it kind of, yeah. it's a precursor of Afro-Latinidad kind of paintings. So I'm going to keep moving a little bit because I want to actually um, get to the series of paintings that has to do with prison, which is a really remarkable series. And again, it's very indebted to Pinheiro, like the title of this one. It's the Annunciation according to Mickey Pinheiro. Cupcake and it's fun. based on... Um, a play that Pinheiro wrote called Short Eyes, and uh, we are going to screen this film. Uh, Be prepared. There was a film made of the, the play. Yeah. Yes, it's a very kind of a tough scenario, but um, anyways, Martin, he, he was, you know, a, a mama's boy, but he lived vicariously through a lot of these guys that he met in the Lower East Side, who actually, uh, they were uh, petty thieves, Yes. Many of them had done time in, in, uh, at Rikers uh, or some other prison. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Martin becomes the chronicler of that, which is very, very interesting. This, again, is his friend Sharp. That's Sharp, yes. And the interesting thing about this painting is that uh, Sharp actually went to jail for some, some minor offense. But this painting... <laughs> Actually, it's a collage because Martin was on a trip with uh, Sharp and his mother, and he did a, a picture of uh, Sharp in bed in a hotel. He shot a photograph. And he, he shot a photograph. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he used the, the photograph as the source for this painting. But again, I mean, this is a whole idealized vision of prison. So he's fantasizing about this place where all these men live, and they spend a lot of time in the gym, as you can see, and uh, <laughs> shit's are very clean, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a very safe environment, and it's just um, a place for him to exercise his eroticism. And, and he was, and this is all in his mind, because in fact, one of the things we do want to emphasize is that uh, or not emphasize, but that you should know is that Martin would never have been very comfortable being, being pegged as a gay artist either. His mother was not accepting of his gay um, identity. Sharp was always, throughout his life, was, all, was critical of Martin's um, work um, that uh, fetishized men, even though he was always... He, he was always in his photos and in his paintings. Martin uh, Sharp criticized Martin for being gay. Mm -hmm. And Martin had a, this tendency throughout his life to go after straight men. It was almost like he, this, uh, this the un unrequited love mm -hmm. was what kind of fired his imagination. Yeah. Yeah. And this kind of a cult of masculinity, right? The this cult of masculinity. Masculine. Because Miguel Pinheiro also was, well, I guess maybe you could say he was bisexual, but Miguel, both Miguel Pinheiro and um, Miguel Algarín, the co-founders of the New York and Poets Cafe, they were both gay men. Both men would, were, didn't want to be part or seen as part of the gay movement. I think that's part of Latino culture. And um, at that time, which could be hi highly homophobic at that time. So they had a real conflicted relationship about their homosexuality. And when you look at Short Eyes, it depicts um, 
homosocial relationships among men in jail, really it's, it's, about, it's about power, than um, attraction, than love. But Martin reimagines it as a, love, uh, as a love story that actually doesn't appear at all in the play. Uh, this, I believe, it's the last scene of uh, uh, prison, and Yasmin, mean, you can talk a bit about this again, because this is actually an homage to Pinheiro. Pinheiro had passed away by this time. Yes. Pinheiro was the same age as Martin, and he died of cirrhosis. Cirrhosis of the liver. Of the liver. Oh, yeah. And, he was an alcoholic. Uh, and this, uh, this painting kind of uh, uh, pays homage to, to Pinheiro's entire life. There is actually the date of birth and death. And uh, it makes a reference to, to short eyes again, yes? Right, right, because it, um, it was first performed in prison because it was like a workshop for, like a, a workshop at Sing Sing. That's where he learned to write. And then, it, and then Joseph Papp produced it off-Broadway at the public theater, and then it became a film. And again, um, the subject of short eyes is, um, it's, it's about, we don't need to get Okay, into that. all right, yeah. yeah. You'll see. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't, don't, don't okay. spoil it. I won't spoil it. Uh, but this is a, a really remarkable painting. The, the, it's really blown up here, but uh, pay close attention to this. I think it's remarkable how uh, Martin is looking at uh, his time, but also he's, he's acting with uh, some very kind of uh, ancient kind of... Uh, uh, let's say mind, because this has so much to do with the sort of depictions in uh, early Renaissance, for example, when painters, they would kind of uh, uh, adulterate the architecture to be able to show the, the narrative or to narrate a story. And this is exactly what you have here. You have the, the, the Sing Sing, the building, and he cracks a, a hole on the wall so that you can see inside. I mean, it's a really unique piece if you consider this work in the context of what was being done in New York around this, this time. Uh, and we end actually with this one, which is a very straightforward uh, image of a, of a penitentiary, except that there are some flying sauces on top. <laughs> so. Uh, this analogy or this image of uh, uh, incarceration and prison is actually extended to his vision of the city. And he has a series of uh, images of uh, gated buildings, uh, gated storefronts, um, buildings that they are just like shut down. Uh, and these are really monumental scale when he showed the first time in the gallery they're shown uh, at the same level of the floor, sort of creating this illusion that you know, the, the gallery was a street, so to speak. Um, but they're really, they, they're, they're totally unique, I, I think, in terms of uh, uh, American well, were, art. It was, it was a real statement when he did that, because mm -hmm. um, he called it the last picture show. Mm -hmm. And it's definitely one of the signals in his work that right. he's going to be transitioning out of, you know, lo the, the whole Lower East Side scene was kind of closing down mm -hmm. due to gentrification. At that time, people were first manifesting AIDS. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of things all of a sudden started to shut down. Um, people started to die. Yeah. Um, uh, two of these paintings actually, they depict churches which is very interesting to think about because it shows maybe the impossibility of his spiritual redemption. Maybe spirituality is something close to him uh, or that has been maybe debased because the church now is occupying a storefront. So they have like this kind of very interesting uh, different ways to read. And then we get to a phase which it, you, when you come to the last gallery, and that's a series of paintings in which Martin kind of revisits his origins as, a, as an Asian American. And that this series is very remarkable uh, for two things. 
first, in some of them, he brings back the figure of the woman. Or actually, he inserts the figure of the woman, maybe for the first time. And in this one, which was the first work that the Bronx Museum acquired, um, it's very interesting because the man is the subject of the, of the art making. Uh, and the women, they are the artists. Uh, which is such an interesting kind of uh, inversion that he does. And, uh, and then in this one, uh, there is a series of three paintings that he shows the same buildings, which is a, a strip of buildings in, in uh, San Francisco Chinatown. And you see this kid in an airplane. So it's like maybe his memories of Chinatown when he, grew, when he was growing up as a child. Uh, this is the building and it's called Wong Family Benevolent Association. Actually, the Wong family was very prominent in San Francisco. Uh, one of his uncles is, um, had that very famous uh, cooking show on TV, Young Can Cook. Um, and uh, so, you know, middle class, but... Uh, his aunt was Miss, one Miss Chinatown once. Right, and I think we have maybe a picture of her here. You see women driving. <laughs> Uh, so it's it's very, it's kind of a this 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 group of paintings. Um, Yasmin and I have been talking to a lot of people, and some people feel difficult to kind of uh, understand or to read these paintings because they they feel that they have too too many stereotypes. But actually, I think you have to pass go past that to actually begin to read something else that he was kind of interested in. And I believe it was maybe sort of rescuing his uh, sort of a sense of identity and the- uh, and, uh, and many of these were painted of, yes. after he returns to San Francisco, right? Because he, he, he starts to get really sick and his mom right. had, uh, so he spent his last time at home with his mom caring for him in San Francisco. I believe this is his aunt? Yes. Yes. Yeah, she was Miss Chinatown once. And this is a fantastic painting. We thought in bringing this, but uh, it was really huge. And uh, we just didn't have space, but I wanted to include it here. And you see, it's a, it's a Chinese New Year's parade. And what is at the center, at the bottom of the painting, is this young boy looking at all that. It's Martin. So again, you know, over and over, he kind of brings up this, um, uh, the gaze of a young boy looking at all this. This is a self-portrait, and here is really the, the Chino Latino, as, right. as, as uh, Yasmin would say. His features are all kind of uh, transformed. Um, this is 1993, I think he was diagnosed in 1994. That's when he began to lose a lot of weight. Yeah, but yeah. This, um, this is based on a famous photograph um, much earlier in his career of Martin in his, in his apartment. And um, so this is actually what t a typical Martin Wong getup would be. The, the hat, the mm -hmm. Chinese kind of shirt, but also has a little bit of like a cowboy look. And, um, you know, that's, when you see photographs of him, you'll, you'll notice that it's, it's pretty true to life. Yes. And he doubled. And you will notice that the building to the right, uh, there is one man you know, on the ground floor inside the building. And the building to the left, there is a series of uh, a number of women on the third floor. Uh, so there is a little bit of a play there that is kind of a uh, nodding to, that it's a little bit obscure. And then we end with these three paintings which uh, we believe it's like the, the last series of work that uh, he did. So in 1994, he uh, returned to San Francisco to live under the care of his mother, and he passed away in 1999. Uh, he even missed the opening of um, uh, his retrospective of the new museum, which was organized in 1998. And the, these paintings, they're very interesting. They're very small, 
And uh, when I first saw, I did not understand. They, they look very different of everything else. And uh, I only had an opportunity to figure out what this was when I went to his home and his mother took me to the back of the house and she had all these little potted cacti and succulents. And, uh, and among these little plants, there was a few of Martin's ceramics work that he had done in Eureka. And in my mind, I figured that very late in his life, uh, all that he could do was to go to the back of the house and do this painting. And again, it's very interesting, me because he was painting what was around him, yeah. right? So he was always looking what was around him. But it has a real otherworldly quality to it as yeah. well. You know? yeah. I mean, definitely, yeah, I think so. They, yeah. they look kind of more like space, yeah. objects from outer space than necessarily sure. things that are growing in the ground, yeah. right? So I think that's so it. So I think this is it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
you know, but in a very kind of dark way. Yeah. Yes? Uh, you may have mentioned this, but I, but I don't remember. To what extent was he formally trained? To what extent did he self-taught? What were his major um, kind of, who did he admire most in the, in the visual art world? Yeah. So what we know is that he went to Humboldt and he focused on ceramics. And uh, he developed drawing on his own on the street. And later he decided to move on to paintings and he, uh, he was self-taught. So in, in the catalog there is an essay by um, uh, John Yao uh, who has written quite a lot about Martin. And he made this really interesting point about um, you know, the self-taught does not mean that you are naive. So he brings up two other examples of self-taught artists. One of them is Jasper Jones, and the other one is Robert Ryman. So, you know, and he, uh, I thought it was wonderful because it puts uh, Martin's kind of uh, project of becoming a painter in a, in, a, in a league of his own, so. And the other thing is, is New York at that time was just filled with signs of all, you know, we had graffiti, billboard, it was, it was so common to see billboards, um, people could put things up on the street. Um, the city isn't like that now. But there were also so many other artists that were interested in, uh, like Jenny Halter at that time. There were a lot of artists besides graffiti artists that were doing their own kind of sign work. Um, so it was part of the way that we thought um, at that time about representation. And there was, intellectually at that time, you've, you've got to remember that it was a time of semiotics and French theory, which was very interested in language and the relationship between language and thought. Um, so even among, in, in uh, scholarly circles, this notion of language and thought, uh, of course Foucault being the person, you know, the prison house of language, mm -hmm. um, these kinds of discussions were also ongoing in the art world. So that's another yeah. thing that made, that's, that makes Martin so timely, so much of his time. Yeah. Thank you. I just want to quickly mention, if you are interested in seeing that film rendition of Miguel Pinero's Short Eyes, it is next Thursday at 7, the 19th, here at the Wexner Center. So do, do come and see that film. Thank you both. <laughs>